Hello everybody uh, and welcome to another episode of Foggy Day on Olympus where we attempt to give Olympian judgments on everything from the place where the Greek gods live but you know it's a foggy day out there. Yeah my name is Mike Pierce and my name is Koal Campo and today's episode is titled Eastern Catastrophes and we are really excited because it is the first episode in our new series yeah, the, the subtitle is Poland and Ukraine in the Modern Times, which is a little misleading for today at least because we're going to be turning the clock right back, but future episodes are going to be looking at much more recent events. Now, I suspect that these stories can't be told without dragging in Russia on the one side or Germany on the other, is that correct? It certainly is, yes. We're going to... <laughs> We're going to look quite a lot at Russia today, um, but what we're not going to do this time around is give a proper Russian history. There will be some today, um, but people who are really interested in Russian history, or maybe Russians who are watching, might complain, well, you, you didn't follow this through, this is not a proper history of Russia. Uh, we are going to do that in a later series. It seems like we're... we're um, making that kind of promise so often, but we do have a lot of people, a lot of stuff backed up people, I promise. And, and also in respect of Germany, yes, we are going to look at that. We're not in this series going to be looking at the intensively covered events of the Second World War in respect of the German-Soviet battle. Not because they don't matter, they matter enormously, and tens of millions of people were killed, but just because those have been so exhaustively covered elsewhere. We want to look at what's going on at the ground, the ground level between ordinary Poles and Ukrainians and the conflicts that are there and the conflicts that are going on inside those societies underneath all those horrifying events. Uh, but even those are not for today. We are going to be taking the long view, not really getting to modern times until next week. Okay, so we're starting off here with a map of the region as it exists today. Just for people who might be, you know, a little geographically challenged or, or just need some reminding of exactly where these countries are in relation to one another. So we're going to be looking at Poland and Ukraine with, with Russia frequently in the background, particularly in respect of Ukraine. And what about poor little Belarus? Surely that's part of this story also? Yes, it's, it certainly is. Uh, and it's only going to be peripherally part of ours. This was only ever a country since the breakup of the Soviet Union. And its territory was either part of the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union or at various stages part of Poland. So it'll get looked at in that context, but not really as an entity in its own right. Not because that doesn't matter, it does matter, but that's... The, the, the trouble with a series like this is that because these countries all have major neighbours, it could spread out indefinitely. And it's a, an issue of where are you going to say, OK, we'll cover this far and, and no further. We, we will cover these things, but only as far as they impinge on what's going to be our central story this time, which is particularly Poland and Ukraine. Our first episode, we're calling No One Can Even Agree What Happened, The Origins of Ukraine or Russia or both. Can't agree what happened? How can that be? Are there conflicting accounts or conflicting interpretations? Well, not too much in the way of conflicting accounts, but massively in terms of conflicting interpretations. And here we come to a problem that's central to a lot of uh, national histories or national in quotation marks histories that people in the past thought of themselves in very different ways to the way that we think now there's this tendency to assume that countries especially if they in the past they had a name that is the same as something today that they were somehow us back then 
and they weren't. They were their own people. They saw things in, in very different ways. But we all, nearly all, want some kind of, want the reassurance of some kind of heroic account of our own country, whatever it is. And most, at least at the popular level, most national histories are sort of mythic. Now, now mythic is immediately a, a problematic term. At one level, and this is true certainly of all popular national versions of history, it's mythic in the sense that these events really did happen, but the way we put them together to create a certain kind of account, either of heroism or of victimhood or, or some mixture of the two, that they're put together in a mythic kind of way to, to, to create a, a story about who we are or were back in the past. At another level, a, an account could be mythic in the sense that the events aren't real or literally real or literal historical, but they nevertheless tell us some important truths. And, and the third level, of course, of, of mythic is the common or garden one, like unicorns or, or the tooth fairy, you know, mythic in the sense of they're just not true. Some of us happen to believe in unicorns. <laughs> Do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> there was something special about you, and now I think we're creeping a little closer to what it is. Right, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, it's, I'm destroying all your hopes and dreams, I know. I'm a, I'm a cool, cool man. Yeah, it's, well, that happened a long time ago, so it's all right. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> you, you came to, the, to do this series pre-crushed, as it were. Yeah, I know, I know. Yes. What can we do now? <laughs> Okay, so well, what do I want to say here? Okay, well, let, let's take a, a, a fairly trivial example from, say, the, the American mythic account of origins. Take something like Paul Revere's ride. Did he go off galloping through the night, calling out to all the houses that he passed by, the British are coming, the British are coming? No, he certainly didn't, because most of the people along the route thought of themselves as British. And if... <laughs> <laughs> if they thought that uh, he was being negative about them, he, he might have come to um, an unfortunate end. But, but the ride itself certainly did happen. So, so when did that whole, whole, you know, the British are coming, the British are coming thing creep in? Well, d during the early 19th century, with a much more assured American national cogitation upon the events of the American Revolution... And so that, that kind of stuff kind of creeps in and then it becomes a part of what everybody knows, even though that's not quite literally true. Well, that, that's a pretty trivial example. All right. a, a rather more important example might be the, the centrality of the Battle of Kosovo Polje in 1389 to the, to the Serbian mythic account of, account of history. In that mythic account, that the battle was a heroic defeat to the... Ottoman Turks, but probably, you know, it was a drawn battle, <laughs> which is unfortunate. That's a, a rather bigger dent in a, a mythic account of, of the past. What about England? Well, there's this patriotic song, which I think almost never gets sung now. You know, there, there's always been an England, which obviously there hasn't been. But if you want to take it back a long time, well, well, since when was there in England? Well, when the English arrived in the 5th century from Germany, the Anglo-Saxons. Well, really? Surely what we mean by England and the English includes uh, the Vikings who invaded later and the Normans who came along after that. You know, between them, they probably take up more than half of the English language. And then even when we go back to the 5th and 6th centuries, when the, the original English were arriving they were intermingling with and intermarrying with a whole load of Celts. And we found out in recent years from DNA studies that there's a, an absolutely shockingly large continuity of DNA going back to before English times. So what exactly is England? You know, and even before the Vikings shot, there is no such thing as a kingdom of England. There's a whole bunch of little kingdoms. So, you know, all, but, but, but all of these things are only problematic if we want to insist that there's a heroic account of our nation, that people always thought of themselves as belonging nationally in the way that they do now. 
But once we've taken the punch on the chin and realised that that just ain't so, uh, then we're in a better position to absorb some of the, 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 the facts of history. Now, this is certainly true in an area like Central or East Central Europe, like Poland and Ukraine. But what's particularly unfortunate in the case of Ukraine and Russia is that both countries appeal to the same events as absolutely crucial parts of their foundation myths. And so, in a sense, they're like terrible twins. On the Russian side, it's possible for someone like Putin to say, well, there's no such thing as Ukraine, really. They're just a version of us, and they've been deluded into thinking that there's something separate. But we, we go back to the same foundation myth, which we're going to look at now. On the Ukrainian side, you can say, no, no, the myth belongs to us. Well, they probably wouldn't use the myth. The story belongs to us, and, and the Russians have stolen it. <laughs> so that's... That's a very difficult one to reconcile, and that's no small part of what is actually being fought out in the war that's going on in Ukraine right now. Now, what I want, another, not one final thing I want to make, and sorry I've been wittering on so long here, is that <laughs> we are in, there's been so much stuff put online since this war began about Ukraine, including the historical aspect. We cannot, nor are we even going to try to compete with the likes of Timothy Snyder and his amazing series on the, the history of Ukraine, which is you can find on YouTube. Uh, it was taught in the fall of 2022 in Yale and University very generously put the whole thing for free online. If you're not familiar with that, it's Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R. Nor, for that matter, can we compete with a kind of political analysis of someone like Vlad Vexler. This is a simplified version for people who are not familiar with this stuff at all, so they can get some idea of the background. And I do want to emphasise that um, these things are certainly present, they're even salient in the minds of the people fighting one another right now, and, and they're widely divergent takes on that. Okay, well, sorry for wittering on here. Let's console ourselves by looking at a map. So this story, like most stories, is long and complicated. We're going to try and make it short and complicated. Modern Russia and modern Ukraine look back to the same ancestor state, Kievan Rus. That little guy on the end of Rus there looks like an apostrophe, but it's not. It's our equivalent of the... Cyrillic soft sound. So it's not a typo, it's not an apostrophe, that's what it is. So this state, Kievan Rus, centred as the name suggests on Kiev, existed from the 9th century until the 13th and it consisted of Eastern Slavs, let's put it that way. Uh, I'm not sure we can really talk about Russians or Ukrainians at that point. Um, and the funny thing about them is that they're ruled by princes who descended from the Vikings. Are the Slavs descended from Vikings? Where did they come from? No, they're, they're not. Well, we, <laughs> there's only so far we can go back because once we get back beyond any written sources, we're kind of stuck and, and with deducing whatever we can from archeology, span which might be precious little. People were not literate until the arrival of Christianity, which we're gonna to get to in a moment. But outside states did write about them, and so we, we get what fragments we can. The best we can do is say that as far back as we can trace them, the Slavs come from an area around the Pripyat marshes, which is in what, in today's terms, would be northwest Ukraine, southwest Belarus. And then in the 6th and 7th centuries, they spread out in all directions to take up most of the territories where Slavic peoples live today. And in the long run, of course, what happens is that their language starts to fragment as they're used to living somewhere else. They mingle with other people, local forms of speech sprout wings, as it were, and fly off in their own directions. Um, 
which means that today we've got three main branches of Slavic speech. Um, Western Slavs, we're Western Slavic, spoken in Poland and the Czech Republic and Slovakia. South Slavs, so Yuk is the Slavic word for South, so Yugoslavia. So Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Montenegro, Slovenia, Bulgaria also. And Eastern Slavs, so Belarusian, Ukrainian, Russian. Now what that means is, just like English starts off being identical with the, the Germans, they'd come over from, from North Germany, right? Those, that's who the Angles and Saxons are. So the further back into the past you go, the closer English gets to German, the, the nearer you get to the present, the further away it is. The same kind of thing is happening with Slavic. So when we go back to this very early period, the dialects have not drifted that far away from one another. But Vikings, who were going all over the place, I mean some of them were starting to invade England of course, were trading. And they were trading down the river systems. They wanted to get to Constantinople, which we can see on our map here um, on the Byzantine Empire. That was by far and away the biggest city at the western end of the Eurasian landmass. So maybe a million people. I mean, nothing else comes remotely close to that. So there's lots of money to be made. They're trading down the river systems and they eventually establish themselves in Kyiv and become rulers of the local Slavs and establish a state there. So more of the same story that, you know, everybody's backgrounds are kind of intertwined in a way, right? Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> the cure for racism in all directions is compulsory DNA tests all around. That would shut up everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So our, our next slide is, is showing again a map, basically the same state. It, it means that Russians and Ukrainians think of this state as really us back then which, as I've said, is always a mistake. People in the past didn't think in national terms at all, really. Tribal terms, yes. That's one of the reasons why the Slavs won't have had any problems with being ruled by a, a Varangian, a, a Viking uh, ruling class. It, 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 they won't have had any national objections to that. Um, but what this example means is that the two countries, Russia and Ukraine, think of one another as something like twins, inseparable. Um, but of course, very recent events have alienated them very, very considerably from one another. Uh, that's a, a new development. But their histories are different in many ways. Well, what happens with this state Kievan Rus? In 988, uh, Prince Volodymyr, uh, that's the Ukrainian spelling, or Vladimir, if a Russian is telling it. By the way, of course, they're Varangians, so Vikings. The Viking version will have been Valdemar. He, he converted himself and his kingdom from paganism to Byzantine, that is, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Now, that's another long story in itself, and we're not going to go into it here. We might do on some future occasion. But it's understood as a defining event for the identity of both Russia and Ukraine today. And I'm guessing this is supposed to be a, a painting of him being inducted into the church, but it doesn't look very 10th century like. <laughs> no, no, this is this is uh, 19th century. So it's about a thousand years later, or almost a thousand years later. We basically we have no idea what that looked like. Uh, he travelled down from Kiev to the Black Sea coast to Chersonesus where he was given the uh, Byzantine Emperor's sister in marriage as part of the deal. It was like an alliance with the Byzantine Empire. He received their religion and then goes back to Kiev and imposes this on his subjects. That's, that's a big topic in itself and at some stage we will I promise you, look at it properly. But what it does is put this, this kingdom and this people group 
within the orbit of Eastern Christianity rather than Western Christianity. There's a, there's a little story told about it a hundred years later by a monk about how uh, Volodymyr makes this choice and it's clear that it's a preference for the Eastern form over the Western form because amongst much else he feels that he will be properly in charge of the religious authorities in his kingdom still, which if he'd become a Western Catholic, he, he wouldn't be. I knew there had to be a reason other than the fact that his, his wife was... <laughs> right, right. Well, well, yeah, it, it all comes as part of a, a package deal separating out religion and politics. I mean, if you think that's a nightmare today, it would have been far, far worse in this period, you know. Yes. Right. Yes. I mean, part of the story, the monkey story from a hundred years later, that his, were, that his emissaries were so amazed by the beauty of the uh, Hagia Sophia uh, church in Constantinople. Uh, and they thought this must be a sign that God lives among these people and we really need to become some of them. But we, we can take this story with a pinch or maybe a bucket full of, of salt. That again, rather like some of the national stuff we were just talking about is is almost certainly later cogitations on the meaning of, of what happened. But again, we're, we're not going to dive any further into that now. We're going to leap instead 250 years into the future. So this state, Kievan Rus, is slowly, roughly Christianized. And then in the early 13th century, the Mongol invasions happen, bursting right out of northern East Asia, right across the vast plains, and they smash the kingdom of Kievan Rus to pieces, destroy the city, and penetrate onwards into Eastern Europe, where they wreak absolute havoc. They do actually retreat from places like Poland and Hungary and so on. But the region that we're looking at here remains under Mongol or Tatar rule for the next 200 years. And why were the Mongols so successful? I mean, it, it just it seems like absolutely nobody could really beat them. Yeah, that is true. I mean, they, they did suffer some setbacks militarily, but that was rare. I'm no military expert, but from what I understand, uh, a lot of it was down to the incredible training of their cavalry, and an awful lot of their forces were cavalry, and also to the fact that their, the kind of bows they had, bows and arrows, could shoot significantly further than anything that the Europeans had. And then, as we're finding even now in the Ukraine war, the more long range your weaponry is, the more you put the enemy at a huge disadvantage because you can wipe them out before they can even get close to you. Right. So it's it's that right. kind of thing. I also, and again, i way open to correction on this from people making comments on uh, YouTube or whatever, but my understanding is that the Mongols were relatively lightly armoured and so could move around faster. And in what they had for protection was silk shirts, which if they were struck by an arrow, the silk wouldn't break. So you could extract the arrowhead without doing terrible damage to the person. And otherwise that normally wasn't true. Once the arrow was in there, to even getting it out would inflict yet more damage on you. So that meant that injured fighters could more often return to the fray. So you put all of those things together and, and uh, along with the speed of their movement, they, they had pretty much an unbeatable hand. Now, uh, like I say, the caveat I want to give there is I am not a military historian. That's, that's just as I understand it. So that, all of that comes with a little bit of a health warning. And I'm guessing, based, yeah, I'm guessing based on the silk shirts you're talking about, they are coming from further Eastern Asia. Well, yeah, that's that's where they will have got that. Yes, uh, actually, just uh, I'm just thinking here while we're talking. 
was that part of why the Westerners later on were so keen to get involved in the silk trade? I'd always thought it was because it was such beautiful material, but maybe that was something to do with it. I, I don't know. I, anyway, but the, the, the Mongol invasions were absolutely devastating. Uh, I mean, they entailed huge massacres. Hungary's population, and by Hungary we mean here Hungary slash Croatia, because Croatia was part of the Hungarian kingdom, it fell by half as a result of the, the Mongol invasions and other areas by 20 to 40 percent. So, you know, this really was not just any old barbarian invasion. Yep, yeah, this is, is pretty bad and even worse proportionally than World War II, right? Yes, the, the numbers may not have been as big, but as a proportion of the population, it'll have been worse than pretty much anything that happened even in World War II, which is saying <laughs> an awful lot. So the, the kingdoms like um, Poland and Hungary took uh, a couple of generations to rebuild. And the Eastern Slavs, who were under Mongol rule for 200 years, I mean, it takes a lot longer than that. What replaces what had existed is just a bunch of little tree kingdoms. So if we look at this map here, the Eastern Slavs, they're living under little weak principalities that had to pay tribute, that is taxes, to the Tartar Khan on the Volga. Uh, there were a number of Tartar Khans, but because the, 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 the Mongol Tartar Empire broke up within a generation or two. But nevertheless, even what remained was very formidable. And why didn't the Mongols just rule them directly rather than have vassal states? Well, because as with most empires, there, <laughs> there aren't enough people to go around. Right? You take, take a much more recent empire, like the British. Right? Um, how come you know, this little island, which was okay, fairly densely populated, but not that big, with, and never had a very big army, how come it ended up ruling a quarter of the world? Well, it did it by, uh, okay, by its navy, but also by co-opting on the gr at ground level local elites. And that's what all empires have to do, including the Romans. And the Tartars need to do the same thing. They can't do everything directly, uh, at least not on, a, on the kind of vast scale that they had given themselves as a result of their gigantic conquests. So they have these. Uh, but what happens in the end, of course, is one of these little states starts to grow at the expense of the others. And, and that state is Muscovy, which is centred on the city of Moscow. So if they're all just little puppets, how was Muscovy able to grow at the expense of the others? Right, you, you'd expect them all to remain permanently the same and just constantly looking with terror at the um, Tartar Khan on the Volga and simply doing what he said, right? But that's not quite the way it worked out. Muscovy became, in effect, like the tax collector for the Khan and the Volga. Now, something's going on here that happens with loads of these situations. Like, say, the client rulers of the Romans in Palestine and elsewhere. And think of the hatred that tax collectors are viewed with by ordinary Jews, in, as described in the Gospels, and we know from other accounts anyway. The way to get on is to be... The, the, the local who is the, as it were, the worst little toady <laughs> and can offer the, the big ruler more and more money uh, and, and more and more obedience. And so, so Muscovy proves to be the most efficient and ruthless of the tax collectors on behalf of the Khans and so is showered with uh, favour and protection on account of it. But what happens in the long run is that Muscovy then grows at the expense of the others, but it grows to the point where it's finally able to challenge the central power itself. So finally, the day comes when the rulers of Muscovy are able to throw off Mongol Tartar rule. Now, this is a point where those who are interested in specifically Russian history are going to complain that we're not telling that story properly. We're going to be skipping over <laughs> the most important bits, actually, and simply getting, because that, that's not really the point of this series here. We're, 
we will have a history of Russia later. So it manages to throw off Mongol and Tartar rule. Now this map shows the situation in 1453. 1453 is a very important year because towards the south of the map, the Ottoman Empire finally conquers the city of Constantinople and brings the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, finally, finally, to an end. Now you can see from this map that Kiev uh, and the area around Kiev is part of Poland, Poland-Lithuania. And the Golden Horde, the Tartars, are still ruling to the south and east. So we've got the, um, the Khanate of the Crimea, the Golden Horde Khanate, we've got the Khanate of Kazan, and so on. But to the north, we've got some eastern Slavic states, Rizan, Muscovy, Novgorod. So those are now more or less free of Tartar rule. Well, M Muscovy is centred on, on the city of, of Moscow, and over time it grows and grows and grows. So around 1600, it pushed east past the Ural Mountains. Now the Ural Mountains are, are hardly mountains at all. They're a long, low chain of mountains that runs south to north. And geographers usually use these as like the formal separation of Europe from Asia. So west of the Urals, Europe. East of the Urals, Asia. And at that point, you're into Siberia. It ended up conquering the descendants of the fierce Mongols who 400 years earlier had originally conquered Kievan Rus. And in the process, it becomes, uh, by the 18th century, we're using the term Russia. And finally, it gets right the way through to the Pacific and Russia had become a great power. And same question here as with the Mongols. Why was Muscovy able to expand such huge distances? You know, are they now the ones with the invincible military technology? Yeah, they don't really have cutting edge military technology. Uh, I mean, they do, they do have muskets, but <laughs> it, it, it could Again, I'm no military historian, uh, but one could certainly argue uh, one way or the other as to whether muskets were actually a huge advantage over bows and arrows. Um, I, I remember reading somewhere that the, the muskets used in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 had a, a smaller range, uh, a, certainly a smaller lethal range, than the bows, the long bows, used at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, 400 years earlier. Right? <laughs> But they did have those, but mostly what they were pushing into by this time was much weaker little states inhabited by distant descendants of the Mongols. The, the, the Mongols had not kept up anything remotely resembling their initial strength. That what they were doing was conquering basically fairly small, fairly cut off tribal peoples. And of course Siberia is not exactly the most conducive environment to live in so they're all kind of sparsely settled if we look at the map here this shows us the expansion of russia from 1500 to 1800 even though it's not called russia for most of that period it's just muscovy and that shows this happening in stages but once they get beyond the urals there then they there's not a lot in terms of people there's plenty in terms of environment resisting them all the way through to the Pacific. Quite yeah. a lot of territory. It is, it, well, it's, yeah, it was then and it is now the, the biggest country in the world by a long, long way. All right, well, uh, as a lot of people will be saying, great for Russia, what about Ukraine? Well, Ukraina means borderland. And it was never governed as one unit, but was divided between different states. So we're saying that people at the time didn't think of Ukraine as a single unit, that we're doing this for our purposes of ex explanation because Ukraine is a thing now. Right, yes. People aren't thinking in those kinds of terms. Again, there's, we've got modern national consciousness, 
but this consciousness comes to different people at different times and they will define what that what the territory of that nation is in different ways right so it's certainly not there for most of most of history until well rather more than a century say a century and a half ago maybe a bit more than that in some cases so when we're talking about ukraine we're talking about what we now call ukraine what this means is that western central and eastern ukraine have different experiences to one another i mean even that's a simplification but let's go with that simplification for, for, for now without making it any worse for ourselves right three main zones of what is now ukraine have very different kinds of historical experiences and we'll look at what those differences are in a moment and again like all languages where one draws a line between one group of dialects and another and says this is a language is a political question not a linguistic one right so only in the 19th century did writers and intellectuals start speaking of ukrainian as a language and not to get off track here but how does that work with english well english too is well is it a collection of dialects now i guess it it's a collection of accents but the dialects are nearly all mutually intelligible i i dare say that you and indeed i might have trouble in understanding the very roughest accents from glasgow <laughs> but otherwise you know basically we, we we all understand one another really well but that's down to modern conditions and tvs and movies and the internet and what have you but we wouldn't have to go back very far maybe just a couple of generations before that that wouldn't be true i mean i remember when i as a a 15 year old lad went up to yorkshire or yorkshire for my first time i mean i i really was not sure whether the locals were speaking english <laughs> <laughs> that was my lack of exposure right so so how do we define these things well i mean in the case of not to consider american for a moment we'll get to america in a minute in the case of english there there are two main kinds of clusters of dialects there's the sort of southern one and then there's the northern one which sometimes today well very often still gets called scots spoken in southern scotland uh, but also includes the dialects of northeast england you know newcastle newcastle and sunderland and places like that well how on earth did was it decided that the southern one would become standard english well because the capital was in london so the existence of state power and therefore economic power and publishing power once we're into the age of print and so on and that just ends up defining whatever's spoken outside of those dialects as 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 themselves dialects and the, and and one other as the standard what about the difference between britain and america well it's even there it's partly defined by politics of course we understand one another very well for the most part although i lived in the us for 18 years and almost every day encountered some expression that i didn't understand or <laughs> as i know you endured in class i would say something and it would leave you and your fellows looking at me blankly and asking yourselves yes. <laughs> did you just perpetrate another britishism <laughs> which of course he did <laughs> so there's kind of a growing a growing apart between british english and american english but that's also reinforced so in after the revolution there's a tendency by those with some kind of cultural power in the new united states to say well our english we're going to speak better english than the english so the kind of sounds for example that the brits can flaint we're going to separate out and that's enshrined in webster's dictionary or as i should say in Web webster's dictionary <laughs> as americans <laughs> would pronounce it right so we're pronouncing yeah. every syllable not like those silly brits right but that was a conscious decision <laughs> and, and and in webster's dictionary he's defining um words and the standard of the language at as great a distance as possible from what is spoken in britain right so there's that right i mean to an extent that can't possibly succeed in the face of uh modern communications right 
um, where both sides are influencing one another in countless ways and have been for a long time now. But he's writing in a period before any of that exists. Right? And, and, and what, but what there is is the printing press and politics, so, so that can work. This is a bit like the way the communist Yugoslav government wanted to define Serbo-Croat by making different kinds of speech as similar as possible, whereas since the breakup in the 1990s, Serbian and Croatian institutions have wanted to emphasize their differences. Yes, yes. I mean, I could have uh, the price of losing some of our Balkan audience. We could produce an absolutely deliciously malicious podcast episode sometime on the history of this just since, I don't know, the 1950s, right? <laughs> I've got pictures of a, a Pravo piece, you know, a sort of standard school textbook telling you how to write properly uh, and that the language is written in two equal but only slightly different forms using different alphabets and both are equally valid and then trying to minimise the actual differences between them. Uh, and since the 1990s, both sides have been issuing furiously updated Pravo PC every few years, trying to tell the rising generation of school children to use this form, not that form, and the form chosen is always as far distant from that other lot over there as possible. Right? And, and there have been things like you know, linguistic commissions to see into all this kind of thing, uh, as if somehow scholars can determine what is correct when the decision is entirely political and trying to stay connected somehow to what people actually say. Yeah. Did we get off track there? No, I, not really. So, because the, the same kind of, like, ridiculous questions are being raised uh, in respect of languages in, um, uh, in Ukraine uh, and between Ukrainian and, and, uh, and, and Russian and so on. Okay. So, it, now, let, let's look west a bit. In the 16th to 18th centuries, Poland, or Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, perhaps we should say, was an extremely large state, and it included west and central Ukraine. Yeah, that's pretty big. So, so most of what was once Poland is actually no longer Poland. Right, and, and as we'll see in a minute, for about 100 and 30, 140 years, none of Poland was Poland because the state ceased existing. And that no borders are forever. And, and, and for our purposes here, Poland included almost all of what we'd now consider Belarus and Western and Central Ukraine. And of course, it meant that like almost all pre-modern states, it wasn't ethnically or linguistically defined, right? One of the things we expect and if we're nationalists, maybe demand these days, is that there be some linguistic definition of the state, that there be a standard language, and in many countries at least, that it be built around some historic ethnos. Defining that, again, is an absolute nightmare for reasons we could talk about. So, yeah, it's not defined by any of those things. So what is it defined by then? Basically by the rule of the Polish king. <laughs> right? The, the uh, Poland was the area ruled by the king of Poland. As, as, to, to move west a bit across the continent, as Louis XIV in France is supposed to have said, and everybody thinks he did say, I found out some years ago he didn't, he's supposed to have said, l'état c'est moi, the state, it's me. Right? That, that France is what's ruled by the King of France, which is precisely the kind of outlook that the French Revolution was directed against. Right. So within that territory, there will have been people who will have spoken a variety of East Slavic dialects. Remember, Polish is West Slavic, and a whole load of Lithuanians, and a whole bunch of Germans and Jews who are speaking Yiddish, which is the form of German. And, well, by looking at that map, I think we can say almost certainly a whole bunch of people speaking what we'd now call Romanian. And goodness knows what else in there. Yeah, it's certainly not defined by its ethnicity or by its language. And our next map, this one's from 1700, shows Poland in some retreat. And Muscovy, the Tsardom of Muscovy, still in 1700, it shows that what we now call Eastern Ukraine was contested 
between Muscovy, which was muscling in on the area, that's the area in lime green. The Tartars, now much reduced, the area in olive green. And local peasant militias who had wrested free from having to be serfs called Cossacks. And they're in a kind of sludge-coloured area between the lime green and the, and the blue of Poland. Not that sludge-coloured is any indication on how we feel about them. No, no. <laughs> no, not really, not really. Uh, maybe their maybe uh, neighbours and enemies did, yeah. So, by this late stage, the, the Tatars must have been very heavily dependent on their Ottoman allies. Yeah, more or less completely, yeah. But earlier on, not so much. They, they, you know, a century or two before, they'd have been able to sack and burn Moscow. That's way beyond their reach now. They're really having a problem holding off the Muscovites or stroke Russians. And they are allied with the Ottoman Empire and they can't do a lot without them. And as they find out late in the century, they can't even do a lot with them. So in our next map, in 1774, there's a war. Russia grabbed much of what's now eastern Ukraine. So the red shaded territory is ceded directly to Catherine the Great's Russia. And the Crimean Tatars, they're in the yellow and green shaded areas. They have nominal independence, but that only lasts, well, not even a decade. They're annexed by Russia in 1783. So Russia takes control of the Crimean Peninsula. Now, remember, that's a very hot button issue today, right? Russia grabbed Crimea from Ukraine in 2014. And then there's a whole load of debates going on we're not going to enter into now as to whether Ukraine either militarily can get it back or whether the West should back Ukraine to the point of getting it back. That, that's, that's not one for us. right? But if you want to know when, when that was first taken by, by Russia, well, 1783 is your date. So... What we've got to by this stage, by the late 18th century, is Russia in the east of Ukraine and the middle, because it will take that from Poland, as we'll see in a moment, and Austria in the west. Why, why does Poland drop out of the picture? Well, because in the 1770s through to the 1790s, in three stages over 20 years, Poland was completely devoured by three hungry neighbours and ceased to exist until after World War I. And those neighbours were Prussia, the, the big and increasingly powerful state in the northeast of Germany, which going on into the 19th century will end up reuniting Germany under its dominance and its, under its capital in Berlin. Russia and Austria, the, the Habsburg Empire. And in that partition, Russia got central Ukraine from Poland. Remember, it had already grabbed eastern Ukraine, as we just saw from the Ottomans and the Tatars. And Austria got western Ukraine. Well, let's just have a look at the map here. And that shows those partitions, which are happening over on three dates. 1772, 17. 93 and finally it disappears in 1795 and there is no more Polish state until the end of World War One and, and so that's how things stand it, in respect of Ukraine at least that means on the eve of World War One the east and center are in the Russian Empire the western bit is in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay, now what does this mean in practice? It means that people in Eastern Ukraine have been under Russian rule for a long time, since the late 18th century. They are almost all Orthodox, and they've been Russianized. During the Soviet period, quite a few Russians were encouraged to live there. And so many of, for many of them, Russian will be their native language. People in central Ukraine were under Polish rule for a long time and although Orthodox, 
They also had a lot of Catholic Poles living among them, mostly nobles and landlords. And people in Western Ukraine were never under Russian rule at all until 1945. Well, hmm. <sighs> until 1939, briefly, but, but properly, until 1945. They were under Polish and then Austrian rule, both Catholic powers, and after World War I under Polish rule again. Many people are Orthodox, many others are Roman Catholic or Greek Catholic, which we'll say a lot more about on a future occasion. Uh, those are Roman Catholics with Orthodox rituals. And all of them see themselves as Westerners and Russian as Russia has nothing to do with them. So they're, they're very different experiences. So as you travel west in what's now Ukraine, you, you go from, in, in the east, people who look towards Russia. In the centre of the country, people are a bit more ambivalent. And in the west people who virtually define themselves as being nothing to do with Russia. And, it, and basically, it all comes back to this it, sort of, yeah, just the history of who was in charge of this area and that area. And Yes, yes. And one can see this, we're not going to show it now, we will on another occasion, with things like election results. I mean, you, you think, you know, America is fairly, not all of it, but most of it is fairly predictable with red blocks and blue blocks, right? With like you know, blue on the, on the coasts and, and, and red in the center or something. Well, in Ukraine, it was in the 1990s, early 2000s, even more predictable with Western orientated parties gaining, you know, from Kiev and everything West and Russian orientated parties from there and everything East and no exceptions not even any islands of support. So it was, was an absolute split. It, it's not really like that now because Putin has been absolutely magnificent in creating his own enemies. And loads of people who look east have had a radical change of mind over the past decade or so. Yeah, that's, so that's kind of like the, the, the long-term background. And then came the horrible 20th century. So Poland and Ukraine had maybe the, the worst experiences ever that, that you could imagine during the course of the 20th century. And we're going to be looking at quite a lot of those over the course of the next um, couple of episodes. So hold on to your hats, people. That's where we're going. Well, <laughs> lots of exciting stuff, lots of things to, to consider. Right, right. And, 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 and they do, you know, it's, it's impossible to understand what's going on in the minds of people and, and all the various competents in the Ukrainian war right now, if this isn't taken into account. You know, this is not like some, some historical discussion that's just there for the academics. We're looking here at um, popularly how people see who I am and, and, and what that, how that then translates into how people are going to act right now. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank yeah. you for being with us, people. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube and subscribe and all that jazz. Share with your friends. Do all the good stuff. Yes, yeah. Please repost our stuff. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week.